Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, there we go. Yeah, it's one of those presentations. Uh, now, uh, hi, my name's Ben. Um, let's click across. There we are. Um, yes, welcome. Hopefully today what we're able to do is give you a little bit of a, uh, a run through on how we can go ahead and start trying to protect against ransomware using zero trust. So uh, I'd like to start off this presentation very simply by, by talking about software. You know, software, we are using software every single day in our lives, whether that be things like Office, uh, Adobe Acrobat, Google Chrome, or even Dropbox. We use software when we are thinking about using software, but we also use it when we're necessarily not always thinking. Software is integrated into our lives in ways that we do not realize. Uh, operating rooms. You know, we use software in our operating rooms to keep ventilators going. We use it in airlines to get planes up from the sky, landing down safely. My, my favorite implementation of software that people do not realize is actually um, the ambulances. So when an ambulance comes to a traffic light system, uh, the light will try to turn green as quickly as possible to get that ambulance through to its destination as quickly as possible. Makes sense, trying to save lives, all of that kind of stuff, right? That is software. That's all software, but we do not think about that. We just go, oh, okay, well, I've got Google Chrome on my laptop. That's software. That's all I realistically need. And then, obviously, rockets, and rockets are incredibly cool, and that's software in, in and of itself. So, realistically, when it comes down to software, the possibilities of it are truly endless. You know, we are only ever limited by what our mind can think of when it comes down to software. But there is a, an obvious issue here when it does come down to software, because when there is good, there is always bad. You know, yin and yang, all that kind of stuff. So what is the key difference between good software and bad software? Well, it's, it's code. Is it good code or is it bad code? That's realistically all that defines software. And at the end of the day, malware is just software. The only difference is what was it used for? The code, is it good or is it bad? So by that definition, if we go back a couple of slides and we think about it, the malicious possibilities of software are truly endless as well. We are only ever limited by what our mind can realistically think of. And that leads us on to uh, some pretty interesting pieces of software that are out there. Now, uh, the main point of this presentation today was I wanted to talk about ransomware and how it is that zero trust or the zero trust security approach can protect you. But let's, let's have a deep dive into ransomware to start off with. So this is actually the first version of ransomware as we know it today. Now, when we think of ransomware, we think 2012, 2013, Crypto locker v3, spreading across networks and decimating everything, right? That's realistically it. I mean, it hit, crypto locker hit about 250,000 machines globally. But ransomware has actually been around for a lot longer than we think. This, the AIDS Trojan, was actually first released in 1989. Again, we don't think of ransomware being that old. Now, what was the AIDS Trojan? Essentially, it was a, a piece of malware that was sent out on floppy disks or floppy drives. Uh, to AIDS researchers, that's where it's got its name from. Uh, from there, the AIDS researcher would take that floppy disk that was sent out, it was actually sent out through a magazine. Uh, they'd plug it into their machine, it would then essentially install onto their machine, and then that virus was then active, that malware was then active. After the 90th boot cycle, it would then go ahead and essentially encrypt all of your data, exactly the same as ransomware as we know it today. Now the interesting thing is when we think of ransomware, uh, we always think of cryptocurrencies, right? That's how you have to pay to get your data back. Well, back in 1989, cryptocurrencies weren't exactly a thing. So you had to send $189 to a PO box in Panama. Now, obviously, uh, the author, a guy called Joseph Pop, was caught pretty quickly there. Uh, it's, it's not as um, well to hide. You can't, you can't hide that as well as you can with a, a piece of cryptocurrency. So, very interesting uh, kind of piece of uh, history here when it comes to malware. But then jumping forwards a bit, uh, one piece of malware that I expect everyone here has likely heard of, or it was, well, it was all over the news. If you did not hear it, you were probably in a coma at that time or something, the WannaCry attack. 
it literally decimated not just the, the NHS here in the UK, but it did decimate networks across the globe. It wasn't just a UK thing. Um, 92 million estimated cost here. So it, 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 it really did spread quite broad. I think it hit over 200,000 machines globally. And um, the NAO chief was talking about this, and he, he basically said that when it comes to the NHS, they need to get their security and their act together. You know, this was a, a true attack that went through, and it did shut down our national health service. And then we look forwards to, you know, we think we would have learned our lesson there, but then we look forward to today. And this was actually happened last year, I believe it was in May of last year, uh, the Conti v. Free attack on the Irish health service. Okay? Literally took down the entire Irish health system, which is absolutely insane. Don't get me wrong, the NHS in the UK was struggling. You know, we had to cancel appointments, certain surgeries had to shut down, but we were still able to function. This literally shut down their health service. When it came to vaccinations, they were going through vaccination processes at this point in time, they had to write those down on pen and paper. Now, can you imagine in the age that we're in now having to then say, yeah, give me one second, I just need to go and check your file and make sure that everything is okay from a pen and paper perspective. So absolutely insane. Uh, they actually got in by using cobalt strike beacons. Um, so they got into, the, into their servers through there. From there, they were unable to uh, utilize PowerShell and WMIC to be able to delete shadow copies so they didn't have backups. And they then used PowerShell to be able to download ransomware from the cloud and then run it on local systems. Okay, so really, really interesting how these hackers are getting in. This is the Conti, Conti v3 attack um, by the Conti gang. They are actually uh, scaling up at this minute in time. Um, pretty terrifying. The attacks that they're doing are actually growing as well. Now, uh, I need to check if they are still recovering, but as of, I think it was October last year when I checked, uh, they had 95% of their systems up and running, which is great, right? That sounds good. 95% of my systems is back up and running. Bearing in mind this happened in May. And then when you also take into account that this is a national health service, if I said to you that 95% of it was up and running, you'd probably have some pretty big concerns there. <laughs> so ransomware is a true threat. It is an absolute horrific thing that is on our systems. And um, I, I really like this slide. It's by a company called Coveware. Uh, I've got this one in the next one. Um, I pulled some data out of a, a study they produced. Essentially, it says that 77%, or 70%, sorry, of um, ransomware attacks that happen are occurring to businesses of 10 employees to 1,000 employees. 33%, 32% uh, of attacks are ha actually happening for 11 to 100 employee sized companies. So this isn't just big companies they're going for. Is it, also, it is also the small, medium businesses as well. And these attackers, they're also going after your data because they've realized that you've more than likely got backups. They know that you can recover from your backup solution. So, what can they do instead? Well, 77% of those attacks are threatening to leak your data on the dark web. We have seen this time and time again. They're innovating how they are actually sending out malware, how they are delivering malware, whether that be using solutions like SolarWinds, Orion, the breach that happened, uh, I think, early last year, year before. Uh, the Kaseya breach that happened as of late last year, utilizing tools that IT professionals use to deploy software to now deploy ransomware. It's pretty insane. They're using things like rubber duckies, uh, rubber duckies and OMG cables. If you want to see one, come down to our stand. We are downstairs, around the corner kind of thing. Um, we have rubber duckies. They're essentially a little USB. When you plug it into your machine, it acts as a keyboard and then run whatever line of code I have pre-programmed it to do, okay? If you think your security solution will block it, come and see me and we'll test it. I say this at every single event. No one ever comes to see me. <laughs> So seriously, if you think it will, awesome, please go. I, I would love to see that. Uh, unless you're using Threat Locker, and if you are, then it will block it. But that's, that's all over piece. And they're using vulnerabilities. These threat actors are getting into your systems using a multitude of ways. One of my favorite is actually living off the land. Google it, Lolbass Project. You can use the tools that exist on Windows to be able to attack Windows. I can use Run DLL to run remote code straight from GitHub on your machine in protected memory, and there's nothing you can do about it. I can go ahead, I can use PowerShell and Command Prompt to take a copy of your data and upload it to Google Drive, all without you having no idea that that's happening. And your security solution, again, will have no idea. The ways in which these threat actors are getting onto systems is absolutely insane. So how is it we can solve this? Currently, we're using all of these. And I like these, I really do. 
but being realistic, they're not working because we still have these attacks. These attacks are still going on. We still have zero-day attacks that are happening, and it is, frankly, not working, as the slide behind me can tell you. But there are solutions. And this is where ThreatLocker likes to kind of explain it in a bit of a nicer way. Currently, what we should be doing with security is looking at it from an angled approach. Rather than going at it and saying, hey, I've got an AV tool and that's enough, look at it from individual angles. Right down the bottom, human layer. That is employees. Please do not plug in USBs. Yeah? Don't go ahead in the car park. If you find a USB, do not plug it in because you do not know what is on that. Okay? The problem is, as much as we can say this, Doris from accounts is always going to plug that USB in because that's what Doris has always done. And that is why we have detection. Detection's great. Yeah, that's what we have mostly got right now. That's AV tools, that's EDRs, MDRs, anti-phishing, anti-spam, all of that kind of stuff. Again, it's not working. Yeah, they are good to have, but the problem is they're detecting. They're telling you that a problem already exists. The horse has already bolted from the stable. So what we need is a control in place, and that's where Threat Locker sits, over here on the controls piece. Now, we have essentially four main components. We follow the zero trust mindset. So what is zero trust? Well, zero trust at the end of the day is least privilege. Zero trust is essentially saying your users, your machines, your software have least privilege. They are not allowed to access anything that they should not be accessing, okay? It is, I mean, the problem we have with networks at this minute in time is we're kind of, we're, we're implicitly trusting software that exists. We need to move away from that and move to a deny by default approach. The first way to do that is actually by app whitelisting. Essentially, Look at the applications that exist on your machine, the executables that can run, and only allow those executables to be able to run. Any new executable that comes in gets denied by default. That is the easiest way to go ahead and stop any ransomware attack from being able to get onto your system. Further from there, let's go ahead and ring fence those as well. So you can see here, I've got Office. Now, did you know Office can call PowerShell by default? Like, why does Office ever need to call PowerShell? And then further from there, why does PowerShell need to access my files and my folders? Like it, it shouldn't have to, and it shouldn't ever be able to do that, but it can by default. So let's go ahead and ring fence those apps. Let's say you're allowed to run, but you cannot be used to access the internet. You can't access other files and folders, for example. Let's go ahead and control the storage as well. So USB blocking, that's great, but then allow them to be able to be really granular with that. A USB can be read and write, for example, um, or, Failing that, you can go even further, and you can say, okay, well, maybe I want to be able to say, for this file share, only certain applications can access it. Because when an app's installed on your system, it has full access to everything that you have access to, which is great when we think about the original apps that we wanted to be able to run. But then when we think about that really strange app that we installed from that Russian FTP server to fix that very niche issue that we had, because it was really, really, really bugging us, that concerns me then, because that has full access to all of my data, okay? So let's lock down our data so that only certain apps can access it, as shown here. You know, for my backup solution, why do I want any other software like Office, like PowerShell, to be able to access my backup data? Only my backup solution should be able to access this. And then finally, elevation control. Now, one final question that I have for you guys, show of hands, and I will know if you're lying. Trust me, I will. Does anyone here have users on their network who have admin privilege on their machine? Cool. Okay, so we've got like three hands up. Every, the rest of you are lying. As soon as you say, like one person puts their hand up, then everyone else is like, yes, 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 me. Uh, yeah, no, everyone does. Realistically, we all have users on our network who have admin privileges. Let's lock that down. Take away local admin privilege but allow them to be able to run individual applications as an administrator. Jump over that. And by doing all of this, we can go ahead and actually change the paradigm of endpoint security. Now, if you would like to learn how with ThreatLocker we can implement those solutions, please, please, please come and find us. We are downstairs, just around the corner. Uh, do come and find us, and I would be more than happy to show you how that works. Thank you.